Charles Mitchell, good morning. Hello, Don. Great to be with you this morning. <laughs> oh, it's good. Good on this election day as we try to get out the word, make sure because we do have. You know, I get the messages from people saying, "I feel like my vote doesn't count. I don't trust things." And I always say, "Go in person. Get, you know, get out the vote. It's it's so important too." So take me through, um, and I'll give you a chance as well at some point to talk about what election day means to you. But as we talk about Governor Josh Shapiro and the state of educational reform in Pennsylvania, I've known Josh Shapiro for a very long time, knew because he's from, as you know, Abington, Montgomery County, knew him through um, the Police Athletic League. I've been on their board for a long time. And I, I, I have to say, I kind of shake my head. I know in his heart he feels, um, he feels that he let people down when he did that line item, when he was willing to give up on some of the educational reform promises that were campaign promises. Take me through this reform in Pennsylvania, and will this election day impact some of what we're talking about here, especially when it comes to education reform? Sure. Great, Don. Well, you know, you used the term biggity big earlier. (laughs) Um, My perspective is... uh, the real biggity bigs in Pennsylvania are the children that I'm fighting for this morning. And it's perfect that we're talking on Election Day because it creates a contrast. There are some people in the world who really only think about how we're going to change the world this one day a year or every two years or every four years. Whereas I think this is a reminder that the work that has to be done for changing our country and especially for protecting underserved children, particularly in places like Philadelphia, it's 365 days a year, seven days a week, 24 hours a day. It has to be done, and especially the situation that you uh, alluded to earlier, the, the battle that continues, by the way, and I want to make that very yeah. clear to your listeners, this battle for lifeline scholarships, which we discussed the last time I was on, yeah. it continues. And that's such a great example of why people who care about the future of our country, first of all, yeah, you better vote. Like, come on. The only way to guarantee your vote doesn't matter is not to not to cast it. And people have fought and died for your right to cast it. So I don't, I don't want to hear it, quite frankly, from yeah. any. I'm, I'm, I'm from Delco, gone, as you know. Like, yes. I, I, don't know. I, I don't know how to be nice about it. Like, quit whine and go vote. Uh, <laughs> but more importantly, or equally importantly, not more importantly, equally importantly, after you vote, hold the people you vote for or the people you voted against, if they won, accountable for their promises. And that's why I'm so glad to be on with you today to talk about Lifeline Scholarships, because as you know, Governor Shapiro promised Mm -hmm. that he was going to protect the most vulnerable children in our state who are eligible under this bill for $5,000 scholarships or for older children, $10,000 and even more for uh, kids with special needs, for those who need to get out of schools that are not serving them, and go to great schools, like the schools I had the opportunity to go to that you read off earlier. That battle goes on today. The Senate is in session in Harrisburg today. They've passed the bill three times. And, yes, there is still an opportunity this fall for Governor Shapiro to come back to the table to lead like some of the other governors across the country. There was one I recently wrote about in Texas. We can talk about if you want to come back to the table and lead and do the right thing. Yeah, and, and I am a ha- you, you know I'm a half glass full person. I I just I I to me I have to admit I'm not usually shocked by people's actions, but he's somebody who I am surprised because I know personally his own you know their own kids went to a hybrid of faith based private right. schools, and so they get it that you know if you have any of us who have you know if you have a child and you've raised kids and you and I both are raising kids, and so. Yes. You think about that, that you know that even one school year, just one school year, and if there's something that's disrupting, and we had the, obviously, COVID and the pandemic and the restrictions, and so we lost, we have learning losses. But here in Philadelphia, for anybody to just say, well, sorry, can't do it this year, maybe maybe in a couple of years, that that then puts a child, particularly in a certain area code, in let's say Philadelphia or or beyond in Pennsylvania, what that means is they've lost an opportunity that puts their path, their life's journey on a different trajectory than it could have. Education is often the key to getting people out of a situation where they're going to live a life 
where they're doomed, essentially. And, and Charles, I know you and I have talked about this, but ultimately, I don't know how, I don't know how we don't have a greater conversation about the fact that it is racist. In Philadelphia, I'm just going to come out and say it. It's racist that we expect that ki- children here simply do not have the proper education that they deserve that the taxpayers of Pennsylvania have paid for. It's, it's, it's mind boggling that anybody would vote a certain way when they could actually, their vote could actually turn around the lives and change the lives of children here in Philadelphia and across Pennsylvania. Yeah. Well, Don, what you just said is, is so important, especially with respect to the sense of urgency that we should have on this issue, not just on election day, but every day, because you're, you're exactly right. In the life of a child, one school year can be life altering. It can be life changing. It can be make or break when you have that one great teacher or the one great school or whatever it is that turns your life around. It's amazing. And, and when you lose a year or as you're so right in what you said, we have children, especially across your listening area and beyond across Pennsylvania, who at this point have lost multiple years since the, the yes. havoc that the teachers unions created with their selfish, self-interested, disgusting shutdowns in 2020. So we've, we've got a debt to make up to these children. And that's why, you know, anybody who calls me and says, well, you know, you guys fought the good fight for Lifeline scholarships this year. You know, enjoy the holidays and let's keep working on it in 2024. Um, my answer is get off my phone. No way. Yeah. These children do not have time to waste. And furthermore, our state budget in Pennsylvania is not complete. There's still over a billion dollars in funding for which they have not written the bills to yeah. spend it. Uh, so there's a there's a really good, smart humanitarian or excuse me, there's a smart business reason that mm-hmm. this work has to get done between now and Christmas, let alone the humanitarian reasons that you so eloquently laid out. And and I'll add one thing. Uh, It's mind boggling that this isn't done. Yeah, sure. If you want to, that's the definition of structural racism, which does exist. Look no further than what we're doing to children uh, in in our education system. And furthermore, it's corrupt, Mm -hmm. right? Why is this held up? Why are you and I having to have this conversation today? Well, the answer is very simple Mm -hmm. because there's extremely powerful special interests it's called the school unions, and they have funded politicians, including House Majority Leader Matt Bradford, who is literally standing in the schoolhouse door. Montgomery County. There's Montgomery County. He is holding up this bill despite the fact that we now know, and this wasn't the case when you and I last talked on, we now know that there is a bipartisan majority in both houses of the legislature in favor of Lifeline scholarships. There are both Republicans and Democrats who have said publicly that they simply want the opportunity to vote. So how corrupt could it be Mm -hmm. that one man is not allowing people to vote, right? I mean, you you said earlier, right, that some people complain, man, you know, my vote, my vote doesn't count. Well, I would argue your vote has sanctity to it. It's it's a a beautiful thing when you get the chance to cast it. You don't always get your way, uh, but it's really appalling that we have lawmakers who want to vote to help these children, and they're not being allowed to vote because of powerful special interests who have bought influence in Pennsylvania. So you do, you wrote about this and I wanted to get to this um, by Charles Mitchell, as you talk about Texas, you do a compare and contrast and you talk about Texas and the difference between Pennsylvania and Texas and school choice. Can you take us through that a little bit? Sure. Uh, There've been many States that have taken action, on this issue over the last year and and then more broadly the last two or three years. Uh, One of the first was Governor Ducey in Arizona. He's now stepped down. Uh, Governor DeSantis in Florida and and others. Um, And then there was sort of a a burst of activity at the beginning of this year, states like Utah and Arkansas. There are now really two states that are still wrangling over this issue. And it's amazing how similar they are. One's Pennsylvania, one is Texas, both large, diverse states. A lot of people think of Pennsylvania as a blue state, but it's not. We have uh, Republicans and Democrats elected to statewide office, and we have a divided party legislature. And a lot of people think of Texas as being 
kind of dark red, you know, like maroon. Yeah. But it really isn't. You look at some recent elections, Senator Cruz won by about four points in his last election. Mm-hmm. And in particular, the the Texas legislature on many occasions has essentially had a situation that a lot of people thought might happen in Congress a couple of weeks ago where Democrats and Republicans have gotten together to elect a speaker of their house. So all that to say, there's a continuing debate in Texas over basically the same issue as Lifeline scholarships here in Pennsylvania. And the piece that you're referring to that I wrote was designed to analyze the different actions of our two governors. Here we have Governor Josh Shapiro, a Democrat. In Texas, you have Governor Greg Abbott, a Republican, uh, and their own parties control each of their House of Representatives and have both stood in their own governor's way to get this done. But the difference is Governor Abbott has called now repeated special sessions of the legislature. He has demanded action. He has gone to people's districts and campaign. He's he's exercising leadership. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, we haven't seen nearly enough of that yet from Governor Shapiro. And why do I keep saying yet? Well, because, Dawn, I'm a half, I'm glass half full kind of guy, too. <laughs> We've all seen Governor Shapiro's political skills. Walk the dogs, school drop off, meetings from 10 to 3, take kids to soccer, then no time left for a jog. When everyone else is relying on you, it's easy to put your needs last. BetterHelp connects you with a licensed therapist online so you can show up for yourself the way you do for others. Visit BetterHelp.com slash positive to get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp.com slash positive. I got a question for you. What did you do at work today? I put a pasta maker inside of a Ferrari. This is our piggy family, four of our baby pigs. Hey, everybody. My name's Mike Simpson. We're going out of the office on my new show. It's called Do You Work Here? We're going to dig up some fossils. We're going to drive the Wienermobile and put a lion on an airplane. I can honestly say I love my job. Do you want to join us? Even if you're sitting at your desk, search for Do You Work Here on the Odyssey app or wherever you get your podcasts. Ew. Gotta get rid of this old Backstreet Boys t-shirt. Tell me why. Because it stinks, boys. Tell me why. I've washed it so many times, but the odor won't come out. Tell me why. No, you tell me why I can't get rid of this odor. Have you tried Downy Rinse and Refresh? It doesn't just cover up odors. It helps remove them. Wow, it worked, guys. Yeah. Downy Rinse and Refresh removes more odor in one wash than the leading value detergent in three washes. Find it wherever you buy laundry products. I mean, you saw him last year on Election Day, right? Huge victory. So we all know that he can be very persuasive. We all know that he can be a man of action. We saw it with I-95. The question is, why haven't we seen more of that on this issue? Not just going on Fox News, as I'm sure you remember, and saying that every child of God deserves a great education, which is beautiful and true, but also actually doing the work like Governor Abbott is doing in Texas, to wrangle his own party and to allow the bipartisan majorities in both chambers of our legislature to act to get this bill done. It's fine to talk about it. I'm glad to talk about it with you today. The governor's done some talking, but it's time for action because, as you said, these children cannot wait for another school year for a chance. Yeah, Yeah, and and – Education, really, if you look at a good education, a quality education, fixes everything else down the road that's much more expensive. So when you think about, you know, um, incarcerating people or people who are, you know, go through the system by that point, then not only are lives devastated, but as well, society then pays in, in so many ultimate ways. I wanted to touch base with you as we continue our conversation with Charles Mitchell of the uh, Common Foundation, Commonwealth Foundation. You also wrote about the the discouragement of business investment in Pennsylvania, the so-called red tape. And, mm-hmm. you know, recently, and actually this morning, I had reported on the census. Where are all the people going, especially when you look at New Jersey? Oh, my goodness. When you look at how many people left New Jersey and Pennsylvania and California, and where are they heading from Pennsylvania to Florida? Yep. Um, you know, and one of the one of the reasons, yes, the, you might say the pandemic and the shutdowns, but you are you are talking about, in fact, thinking about workers, thinking about where it's business friendly. 
Can you just touch on that as well, Charles? Sure. Uh, and, you know, one of the other states that the numbers showed on is Texas, by the way, the yes. aforementioned Texas. Yes. I mean, I, I can't tell you how many friends I personally have who've left for those kinds of states, North Carolina. You know, I hear a lot about Nashville right now. There's more cranes per capita in Nashville than there is in any other city in the world. Um, but here's the thing. So I, I think there's there's two observations I make. The first is here again, we have the disparity between our governor's campaign promises and our governor's actions mm-hmm. thus far. Um, you may have seen uh, there was an article in the Inquirer on Monday mm-hmm. uh, from one of my colleagues, Jennifer Stefano, that showed the, the results of a study we did on governor's respective productivities. And unfortunately, Gover- Governor Shapiro has been the least productive in terms of getting legislation done of any governor in decades. Well, one of the things he said he was going to get done was regulatory reform to get rid of some of this red tape that chokes businesses and chokes families. Mm-hmm. Now, you can, you know, you can sign executive orders. Um, that's fine. And he's done some of that. Uh, but, you, you know, I heard you talking before I came on about uh, the Trump Biden dynamic and all that. Well, we saw a lot of this with President Trump and President Obama, where, you know, President Obama famously said, I'm going to use my pen and my phone because I can't get Congress to do anything. Well, what that results in is one governor or one president signs executive orders, and then the next one takes them back. And then in the case of what we've seen in Washington, you know, Obama signed them, Trump got rid of them, and now Biden's got them back again. Um, Well, one, that's a colossal waste of, of time. But two, it doesn't create for businesses the certainty that they need. They need to know that the the rug's not going to be pulled out from under them if they make investments. That's why we need to see legislation to get rid of red tape in Pennsylvania and also to cut our business taxes, which we began to do under Governor Wolf. Governor Shapiro said he wanted to accelerate it, Mm -hmm. um, and that that hasn't been done. So the first observation I'd make is, unfortunately, we haven't seen Governor Shapiro keep those promises yet. I'm hopeful that we will, uh, and I hope that your listeners will continue to to um, to press him to do that. The second is we have an opportunity. We have a problem. I just mm-hmm. told you the problem, yeah. right? These promises aren't being kept. But we also have an opportunity. Think about it. There is no other state in our region that if we got our act together could pass something like Lifeline Scholarships, could do, do something like comprehensive deregulation or tax reform. New Jersey's not going to do it. Mm-hmm. New, York, New York's not going to do it. Delaware's not going to do it. Don't even get me started about Maryland and, <laughs> you know, need I go on, right? But, Don, that's our opportunity because we're a different kind of state, because we have a Democratic governor who said he wanted to do these things. My goodness, if we actually did it, we could beat the crap out of every other state <laughs> around us. And, yes, that's a technical economic term. I mean, that's our opportunity, right? We don't yeah. have to just lose all these people to Florida and Texas and North Carolina. We could be the beast of the Northeast. We could be the preferred location to start a business or to send your children to school. And, oh, by the way, most people who start a business also send their children to school. So, you know, we could attract people. That's our that's our opportunity. And, and that's all why I'm really glad to be having this conversation. And particularly around the issue that we started with, I would encourage your listeners, go to fundlifeline.com. That's an easy website that we at Commonwealth Foundation have created where if you like what we're talking about this morning, you can reach out personally to your state lawmakers who care what you have to say and tell them it's time to act. We made these campaign promises last year on Election Day. Now it's another Election Day. It's time to keep them. It's past time to keep them. So let's do it now. Well, thank you, Charles Mitchell. Just one final question for you, because you, you, you're you a Delco native, but you also um, started out as a newspaper editor in college, and it was under attack. You were under attack, and you felt that when you defended free speech, and I think that put you on a pathway when we talk about education and things that happen in life that might spark your future. For you, as you look at, and for example, you know, my friend uh, Jen Stefano talking about the Inquirer, there's a connection, is there not, between the media and what the media chooses to shine a light on. It's bias by omission, if you will, when in fact, other than uh, than, uh, Jennifer Stefano's article in the Inquirer, you rarely see that kind of article or that kind of news story 
on on social media, et cetera, because, in fact, our governor's a Democrat. And so they won't call him out as much or we don't see the, the checks and balances. When you look forward and you think about Election Day coverage, media and a real loss, um, really a, a loss of, of faith and trust and belief in our institutions, what do you see for the future? Hmm. What a great question. Um, what I see for the future is a need for people to build. That's the way I would say it. So, for example, uh, you mentioned my colleague, Jennifer. Um, she and I have both been a part of building new media institutions to solve exactly the problem that you talked about. One of them is located in Philadelphia. It's called Broad and Liberty. Uh, and then there's another one that's that's national that now has enormous circulation. Actually, it's uh, its circulation makes it the second largest news publication in Pennsylvania. Um, and I can get more into the details, but the point is uh, that problem is real. And as you know, that that very problem of bias and cancel culture um, changed my life. Mm-hmm. And the reason it did that is because I wouldn't take it lying down. And I've now dedicated my life to trying to solve some of these problems. And I think that at the end of the day is the question that everyone has to answer. It's it's not a question, are there severe problems in the world that can cause you to be upset or demotivated or whatever? They're there, and we all know them. And I'm not going to list them because your listeners are are well familiar. Mm -hmm. The only question is, are you going to be part of the problem or are you going to be part of the solution? And if all you're doing is yelling at your television, you're part of the problem. And if all you're doing is complaining to your friends and drinking beer, you're part of the problem. We have to be part of the solution. So whether it's Governor Shapiro and education, he needs to be part of the solution. He needs to do the hard work. He needs to defy the public sector unions, uh, which gave him a lot of money. And he needs to make some tough choices and lead, like Governor Abbott in Texas, or if it's a listener of yours who makes those entirely correct observations about what's being suppressed in the media. It, it's all true. So do something about it. That's what our founders did. That's, that's the heritage of America. We, we don't ignore big problems. We see them, we acknowledge them, um, and we do something about it. And finally, that's why I appreciate you. I appreciate that these conversations do happen on your show. I know that there aren't enough shows um, but I also know in the same way, you know, you could be fishing down the shore right now instead of having this conversation with me and leading the conversation that you had before I came on. This this is the work that Ben Franklin and all the others back in Philadelphia a couple hundred years ago mm-hmm. said we had to do. Mm-hmm. And there's no better day than Election Day to reflect on what I consider to be a sacred responsibility that we all have to be part of making our country better and solving its problems not either sitting on the sidelines or just making it worse. Beautifully said. A call to action by my friend Charles Mitchell, president and CEO of the Commonwealth Foundation, and it is Pennsylvania's free market think tank. Charles, thank you so much uh, for for the words of inspiration, because I think maybe we needed that. Hoorah! Get out there. Let's do this. Right? (laughs) Let's go do it. Thanks so much, Don. Thank you, Charles. Until next time. Thank you.